Hello, uh, welcome to oh, it's the Wellbeing Show, that's it. I've only been doing it for two years, I can't really remember. It's just today has been so hot, my brain has absolutely frazzled. Um, it's, it's sort of slow in the best of times, my brain, given my age, but um, today in particular, um, it's been a, a real struggle to get it engaged. But here we are, the Wellbeing Show. We have a, a great guest with us tonight, Nick Cohn, who uh, we will talk to in just a moment. But um, first of all, I'll sort of just remind you it's live if it's a Wednesday evening, vaguely between 9 and 10 UK time. Um, it'd be lovely if you joined in. Um, there's various ways you can do that. We're streaming on um, Facebook Live, YouTube, and on Twitter via Twitch. And you're welcome. Welcome to join us, drop some comments. My team will be <clears throat> scanning the airwaves, as it were, and uh, will message me um, any questions, comments you've got, or you can give me a call. Um, plus four four seven five zero six three one nine seven four two. Um, you can tell it's hot. I was forgetting my own phone number, which I'd known for decades. So there you go. Uh, anyway, enough of that. It'd be great to hear from you. Do let us know. Um, and we have this evening very excited to bring on um, uh, a fellow entrepreneur, CEO, company founder, uh, and all round uh, good chap called Nick Cohn. Hello, Nick. Is it is it Con or Cohn? Con, unfortunately, no. Oh, that's okay. Um, so thank you for it. Welcome, welcome to the show. Really good to have you here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being called Con, given your own background, um, there might be some sort of. Um, a sense of justice in that. Well, Nick stuff, con people, it was destined, you know. It was never going to end well, was it? <laughs> it was maybe foreboding, um, uh, sort of the um, sort of naming you. Maybe it's yeah. as you belong to the Guild of Cons in the, back, right. in the past somewhere. So great to have you on, Nick, and we'll sort of get catch up with um, what you do. Uh, Nick essentially works in the uh, addiction recovery field and um, you're in recovery yourself so we're going to hear something about your story. Um, but we, you know, there's been this sort of um, thing that's been going on in the background for the last 18 months called a pandemic. I don't know if you've heard of it, Nick. No, new to me. No, is it? I sort of, anyway. I don't like, going, think, out, I don't like going out and mixing with people. <laughs> <laughs> they they say if lockdown made things better for you, you've really got problems. <laughs> and so sort of, oh, am I isolating? I haven't noticed a change in my lifestyle. There you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. They said you have to go out for the fifteen minute walk a day. That was, you know, that's, that's right. Really. That much. Get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely um how's it been for you now that we're sort of in the land of the happy and the free how, how have you fared the last sort of 18 months yourself personally and professionally with your family and so on so we've it's been interesting because we, we've got a we've got a three-year-old boy <laughs> um, and we've got a six-month-old girl wow. so it's it's been quite interesting because he's you know, prior to lockdown, he was he was a baby, and now, kind of after lockdown, he's talking. He's he's a proper boy, so it's it's been very interesting. Half of his life was effectively written off, you know, from being able to do things. So um, it's getting a lot of fun for him now. Um, so that's that's lovely to see. And then with the newborn, um, it's been a bloody nightmare. <laughs> It's been hell. They, uh, they are only for the first seven years. After that, oh, do you know what? That, then they get tough. I said to my wife, "Surely it's time she gets married and moves out already." <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> Correct. So, um, right. so it's yeah, it's been it's been it's been very rewarding because I certainly the first part I was at home a lot more, so it's lovely to yeah. be with kids. Um, and, and kind of on the flip side of it, it's um, it's been challenging and it's been tough for everybody, you know. I think yeah. it's been, and on another side of it, you know, we've had the busiest year we've ever had, or the busiest two years we've ever had, which is, you know, good on some, you know, well, I think it's good on all levels because either way it's people getting help. Yeah. You know? So, um, but, and, you know, on the other side, I've had friends that have lost their businesses and it's just, 
it's, 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 it's very unusual times, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And what's your feeling now about as we come out? I mean, you say your boy is sort of really enjoying. It's great to hear because I know a lot of parents are anxious about long-term impacts on kids, particularly young kids. I, I'm my boy who's 10 has taken all in his stride really he's off now back to normal and go creating havoc wherever he sort of happens to be so he seems okay to me I'm sure there'll be some issues later on um that is not processed how are you worried about your kids or no I think we kind of slipped through the net because he's um his nursery was pretty much open right. I would say 80 85 percent of it Great. So that that kind of a was helped my wife out a bit, you know, because it's hard with 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 the, with the kids. And um, but um, you know, for him, it, it was essential because he can't sit still. Yeah, he can't well, sit still. Kids can't. I mean, they they need complex social interaction, don't they? They're non-stop demanding attention, as you know, from the newborn. And congratulations, by the way, <laughs> demanding attention. So are we talking about my wife now or the kids? Uh, yeah, or, or yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's me so I'm the one that needs all the attention and reassurance in my family I'm, you, I'm the one that's neurotic and insecure everybody else I identify, enough, you know? I identify that's for sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so but it's you know it's interesting sort of talking about these things and I, I don't know when you came to recovery just over a decade ago I think it was 12, 12 it? years ago now yeah yeah so I mean congratulations on that thank you um, and but I'm guessing if I'd had this conversation with you 14 years ago, um, we'd be talking in a very different way about things, and you'd be experiencing life in a very different way. Well, I think the show would be very innovative if we were speaking on Zoom. Firstly, <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've always been ahead of the curve, though, Nick. You know? <laughs> if I'm honest, I probably would have sold the laptop I'm talking to you on for cocaine um so that would have made this this very difficult so yeah you know, but, um, and here you are taking things in your stride challenging things um which is testament to you know stop using get some recovery under your belt and get on with life you know and i say this to many people that that that, that i've worked with over the years and, and i said to them do, do you know what recovery is about hmm. and they say yeah it's about stopping drink or drugs and i'm like no it's not you know for me it's about having fun yeah you know, um, because that's one thing that I did not have in recovery. My head will glamorize those few occasions where, you know, you know, where it was a great night and this, that, and the other, but it will forget the other tens of thousand instances yeah. where it was hell. Yeah. Staring through a spy hole in a hotel door, you know, uh, convinced someone's coming. Yeah. The you paranoia know? and uh, it, it doesn't lead to much fun, um, sort of. Um, and the come downs and all that. So um, uh, you you don't, you don't seem to me like an addict. I don't know what an addict should seem like these days, but um, sort of uh, you're currently based in Hertfordshire, I think personally, and then you've got businesses around the UK, but you've also got a residential treatment service in Norfolk. I know you're off there this morning. Um, so tell me a, a little bit about you so I get some idea of, of sort of, I mean, you haven't got loads of tattoos. I haven't. You don't look like you were some <laughs> devious murderer who ended up in strange. <laughs> a lot of people's perception is is you know an al- you know an alcoholic or is that person on a park bench drinking out yeah. of a brown paper bag, and and that's not the case. It's that person that has a drink and finds it hard to stop. Yeah, and that's as simple as what an alcoholic is, you know. And certainly with addiction, there's so many different layers, and and everyone's rock bottom is different, you know. Um, and so when, what about you in terms of growing up and stuff like that? The sort of the, the, where, 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 you, where were you brought up? So I was brought up in Hertfordshire. Um, okay. And I think growing up for me, I always wanted more of whatever more or whatever that was. If, you know, if I, if I got something for Christmas, I always wanted something more better. Um, I remember going over to a friend's house every Thursday, go over to his house when I was six or seven. Um, and I asked my mum to stop going there because his mum made small portions of food. <laughs> um, and <laughs> just, just observe. Um, and, um, Great. 
<laughs> there was always more. And, and anyway, as, as I grew up, I think I had more fun than Brighton. But it was it was this image that I was projecting out internally. Sure. I had very um, low self-esteem. I was very insecure. Um, and when I took cocaine for the first time, cocaine was my drug of choice. Yeah. Um, when I took cocaine for the first time, it did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Yeah. Um, it gave me this overwhelming confidence, this euphoria, this every way that I wanted to feel growing up, it ticked my boxes. So was there something wrong with your childhood? I mean, did your parents no, so there was, you there was, out of... You know, there, was, there was no there was no kind of obvious or typical signs of trauma um, but I had a father figure that was absent emotionally and physically not because of um, because of any other reason except he worked nights he was is in well, he still does his wholesale fruits and veg mm -hmm. and that was because he wanted to put food on the table and send yeah. us to school and and give us the things that we wanted or needed you know, growing up. To be honest, if, if, if that caused addiction, there'd be a lot more addicts in the world yeah. than, than there currently are. Do, do you know what well, I mean? It's like that's that they do, Well, they do say that one in three of us are addicts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and the thing is, there's so many different, um, yeah. you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, porn, yeah. spending, whatever. That's just yeah. someone's solution. It's not their problem. You know? Yeah. And, and your um, mum, she was, I guess, loving and yeah, lo loving nice. family. And I think my my mum was she she also is is insecure. And I think that kind of passed that over to me. Yeah. Um, and I think you know I spent three months in rehab, and I think that is pretty much um, a big part of, of of where it was coming from. So there was you know I wasn't didn't go without. I didn't you know I didn't have um, any abuse in any way. Um, I've got nothing to blame, you know, blame it on. Um, I have uh, a genetic predisposition. I'm an addict, you know, and... Um, and I mean, it's interesting. I'm, uh, the reason why I'm asking is because I, I guess we need to myth bust around this stuff about, you know, uh, what goes on. I've, I've heard stories similar to yours from lots and lots of people. I mean, I've been practising for over 25 years now and um, been in the field that, that length of time and um you started uh, when you were 15 now yeah well done you can come <laughs> back <laughs> good for him Yay. i wonder why we're get james get his phone number make sure we bring him back on um, <laughs> yeah right i wish um there were certain things i started at 15 but not <laughs> not this work i'm promising um uh, sort of uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I think there is this prevailing myth now, and I, I think it's also because it's promoted by certain TV personalities that, you know, trauma is the core of addiction. I meet loads of people that... I'm not saying trauma isn't associated. I think there are there's good research evidence to show it's more about adaptations to historical trauma than it is the experience of childhood trauma. Um, and I think it's really, really important to get that message out there, the one that you're talking about, which is there's a predisposition in some people and it can be switched on simply by using. It's a sort of, um, it, it, it's a, a genetic predisposition, but it's a, it's a capacity. You have to do something to switch it on. I think, I think yeah, I think there's certain there's there's, there's more there's certainly one more than one entry point into addiction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice way of saying it. Yeah. Definitely. But I think I think it was Gabamato that said um, to to look at addiction, firstly you've got to look at what's the rewards, what is addiction doing yeah. for you? And it's to take away that pain. So then the it goes back to say then why the pain? Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's certainly, there's, I, I think the, sort of where I go with it is this, that I, I think there's, there's an inappropriate school of thought that thinks that you um, should see addiction as resulting from, as opposed to it is. Mm. Um, and sort of where I come from is addiction is a primary condition that is associated to other conditions mm. and can complicate and stand alongside. And addiction needs a set of treatment um, protocols around it. 
and it needs to be identified as such. Um, otherwise, there's a problem with um, misdiagnosis and then the wrong treatment, essentially. Um, and, and so it can go on forever. I mean, I'm talking personally, but also professionally. I've seen uh, you end up with services that enable rather than challenge the using. And uh, mm-hmm. I think we're changing, you know, um, we're beginning to see it. But it, for me, I think it's really important that we make the point. And I think you said it very clearly. There are lots of entry points into this place. And for some people, definitely uh, trauma is their route into addictive using with antidotes. And it's part of the diagnostic criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder is substance misuse as an attempt to regulate. Um, but not everybody who's had trauma who then gets treatment goes on to addictive use. And and that's where I think so, we need to be clearer, <clears throat> you know? I, I included, I came up with a new one, which I feel is quite relevant, which is called circumstantial. Yeah. So, so for argument say, I've had this on a few occasions, scaffolders that have fallen off scaffolding, yeah. done the back and broke their neck, done whatever, and the painkillers that they're getting just aren't doing the job, you know? And then whatever happens, circumstances, they're getting to choice to introduce to opiates, maybe perhaps legal first, opioids, you know? And then, and then that progresses. And, you know, you, you kind of think, God, you know, if you're in that much pain, you, no one can live like that. That's not living. You want to take that pain away. That's natural. Um, so if you find something that takes that pain away, you can't help but take it. And yeah. certainly with that, the Oprah sort of family, you know, you, you're going to become very dependent very quickly. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a nice way of saying it, because I think that's very compassionate and understanding. Um, and that's, that's definitely what's needed. Um, but there weren't any, from what you're saying in in terms of the there weren't any particular sort of significant triggers or push factors there was but there was as you you have a sense in which you were trying to grab more of everything and and things just didn't feel enough which is very very classic um symptom and it's a sign that the dopamine system in your brain isn't working properly and then that's one of the things is dopamine regulation is very difficult um, for addicts because of the damage to the d2 receptors and that sense of less pleasure is real for people who've inherited addiction. Um, Mammals will desert their offspring for dopamine. Absolutely, without a doubt. And that's what addicts do. We desert our offspring to desert ourselves, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's a nice way of saying it. So um, it's interesting, again, I think it's interesting because I think, I mean, mean, I'm not a great fan of Gabor Mata, I have to say, or of, there's a British guy who used to be a comedian, I think, and there is... Not Johan um, Harry. Who? Not Johan Harry. Uh, he's one of them, but I wouldn't say he's a com- ever been a comedian, Johan. <laughs> <laughs> he went I may have bad. laughed at him, but no, no, I don't think he's meant me to. Um, no, Russell Brand, yeah, that's the bloke I'm thinking of, you know. Yeah. Um, and so the, there is a there is a thing that this bunch of people are promoting. Um, and and I think it's important work, but it's not the whole story. And that sense of lack of the sort of um, um, engagement, meaning, fulfillment in life is, I think, a really important thing to look at when you're looking at, say, young people and kids and trying to figure out if they have some problems and issues. Because I think there's something about that, about I'm trying to deal with that sense of I have less satisfaction than other people. And that may be complicated by other factors such as trauma or, or poverty or absent parenting or whatever it is. But the core of it seems to be that. And I think that's one of the sort of uh, one of the really clear diagnostic criteria. Was, was there a history of addiction in your family at all? Was that? Uh, there is with my brother. Um, right. So we, thank God we managed to get, get him into recovery now. But, right. um, but not not further back than I know, and, and just touching on what you were saying about Russell Brand and Gabo Mate and this, that and the other, <clears throat> it frustrates me um, when they feel their journey or their way yes. is what they're trying to push on. This is how you treat addiction. Yeah. You know, from my experience, perhaps maybe not as much as that, perhaps I picked up something they haven't, I don't know. But I, I ran 
a, a helpline that dealt with the front line of it and have done for many years. So yeah. those first calls that come in in crisis, I, I dealt with, okay, team deal with now, but it's a, it's a person-centered approach. It's required. Everyone is different, yeah. you know, and everyone's reasons, everyone's um, backstories, everyone's entry points, everyone's different. Yeah. One solution doesn't fix that. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 no, I totally agree. I mean, I think I tell patients, I, I say it's a, it's a bit like the half-cooked spaghetti method that we've got. We actually can't really say what's going to work for you, but what we can tell you is these are the range of things that we know have worked for other people. Let's give them a go. And let's give them a go systematically and figure out what works for you. It might be a combination of stuff. And, uh, and, and I think sort of it's necessary to have that humility around this because I... Nobody has the magic bully in this stuff, mate. Absolutely. There'd be, no. there'd be no addicts. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and take a look. That ain't true, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's. I think there are great hopes with the next generation of sort of neurological research. And I think there are possibly viral treatments that are going to come out soon. We, we've just um, we've actually just launched something this week yeah. um, at the rehab. Um, virtual reality addiction exposure therapy. Okay, yeah, nice. So uh, we've invested heavily in this technology. And yeah. Basically, you can chop up a line of cocaine and snort it. Yeah. You can pour yourself your drink of choice. You can roll a joint and smoke it. You can play with heroin. Yeah. Um, and then you can go into an observation mode where an actor is actually at a party and he's offering you cocaine. Yeah. You know? And so we, what we want to do is... is Really this is in a VR environment. Virtual reality, yeah, we're not actually letting... I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make that point, people. Although I feel it, it, it's be... not one of those weird treatment models where you get <laughs> yeah. stoned or I dropped. feel that we would get a lot of clients, but not ones that want to get well. That's fine. Um, so it so sounds more like... No, don't, don't tell California about it, for God's sake. <laughs> sounds um, like, what's his name, Lineker's um, <laughs> parties, doesn't it? Um, so, you know, it's... Uh, and so the idea is in, in the virtual reality, you stimulate the neurological processes. Yeah, so you can be associated with music. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a variety of things, but ultimately, yes, that absolutely, and triggering the craving yeah. and working with that client in the craving. Um, Brilliant. And... Um, the evidence that's stacking up with this is, is, is incredible. And that's the great yeah, thing is more and more and more and more. It's self-evidently sensible. Um, that, like the um, uh, the American army have been using virtual reality worlds as pain treatments um, for soldiers that have got severe burns and injury rather than opiates. And, and gaming and virtual reality is, is shown to be incredibly powerful, um, much more powerful than opiates, actually, in terms of pain management. The end problem is... You know, carrying a whole VR suite with you all the time is a bit of a pain in the arm. But... Walk into a lot of things. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got some more pain now. Uh, but um, oh, that's brilliant. When did that start? When did you start that? We started it last week. Um, oh, wow. So we've, we we do it in a kind of psych psychosocial support you know, in, yeah. environment and group therapy. Um, I'd love and... to give it a go if you're up for it, and um, then bring you back on. And I think the techniques like that. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Honestly, it's brilliant. We had we had someone come in actually, um, yeah. that was bless him, was having an anxiety attack when they when they walked in. And um put, I just felt so sorry for them. Cut long story short, one of the therapists had this really good idea. Let's get the VR headset on them. Yes. yes. And put them so another module that it has on it is we can put them under the sea with dolphins nice. and it's a guided meditation with this beautiful music on. Yeah. And you just saw this person that was having a complete panic attack, just like and, and just completely calmed down. So it's got other benefits, you know, for for that kind of holistic sense. Um, and that's, I think, that sort of virtual world stuff is is absolutely brilliant because it does. Um, what you can do is you can safely take people into those triggers and teach them practical social, educational, emotional. Uh, relational skills to help them manage those things because the idea is and, and this is the problem when I think I'm sure you'll nod away at this but the, the problem with just simply saying it's about abstinence is um, that, that recovery is simply about abstinence it's not it's about having a relationship to those things that 
means that they don't have any control over you anymore and they don't control your decisions and you reclaim your personal power to make decisions about using or not using. So it's that sense of being able to have a sort of neutral relationship to the things in the past that made you obsessed and need to use them. And using VR seems to me a really sensible way of doing that. But another, another angle, which was kind of the method behind my madness at the yeah. time, was... Don't, don't claim too much for yourself. We know this not happen. <laughs> You're just stumbling around, pinning the tail on the donkey every now and then, and get it in the right place. So don't try and oversell me. Here, mate. Yeah, yeah you're, not, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, so the, um, the kind of method was, we certainly around, it started around the alcohol. Yeah. Because one thing I hate <clears throat> is repeat customers. Um, Good. Good. And... and Everything that we're doing, we're building, is to try and not have that repeat. We, they're part of our family. We don't offer a year aftercare like all the other rehabs. We do lifetime aftercare. Yeah. And then what we do, and once they graduate, they then take on someone that's about to graduate. Oh, nice, nice. It becomes like a buddy system. Yeah. And um, so we build this kind of family, and then after six months, they become an ambassador <clears throat> and so forth. So um, where was I going with that? So basically, with, with alcohol, listen life is life yeah. and certain things that are tough to get out of your sister's getting married two months after coming out of rehab exactly <laughs> yeah, that's... what do you do do you wait for that to be the first time that they're around alcohol and yeah. not have not been in that environment before be unaware of what to do you know or do you put them in that a safe environment virtual reality around the alcohol and you actually put them in that party environment or at a bar and do you process it with them there or no? No, um, I'm totally with you. I mean, I think this notion, one of the reasons I'm a bit suspicious of a lot of these residential treatment services is because they remove triggers. And I'm like, well, what are you going to learn by that? Anybody can stay clean and sober in a sanitised environment 100%. where nobody's prodding you or nobody's trying to sell you anything. Easiest thing in the world, mate. It's yeah. the real world. You haven't got your yeah. phone. It's stress-free. Yeah. You know. Exactly. I mean, I, I just don't... It's not life. It's yeah, not it life. isn't. And I, I think it's sort of unreal and the, the sort of skills people learn there are not, not transferable. We know because most rehabs have about a 15% success rate, which, which is, it, which is absolutely not good enough. And, well, um, it isn't. And, Particularly it, because just wishful thinking will give you 12%. Do you know what I mean? So placebo is 12% success rate. And yeah. to yeah. say you've got a treatment service, which is only 3% better than that, isn't a treatment service. It's, it's and just it not. me when, you know, you, you offer one approach, many rehabs offer the Minnesota model, you know, and it's yeah. 12 steps. Now, the 12 steps wasn't formed or formulated or designed for a rehab. The yeah. 12 steps was designed for Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. which then developed Cocaine Anonymous, Narcotics yeah, Anonymous. Exactly. You get that for free. Yeah. Why would you pay money to go into a rehab to get that? So yes, you know, there needs to be much more that's delivered and much more support. People do not take the aftercare seriously enough. Yeah. Thanks for your money. Goodbye. Go to the fellowship. Go to Alcoholics Anonymous and go to ninety meetings in ninety days. That's not aftercare. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, yeah. certainly because I come very much from the model of you're alongside people in their real lives, yeah. and then you develop systems and services that allow people to, in real world situations, try things out, make mistakes, learn from them, um, but hopefully in a safe way. Um, and 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 that sort of the acceptance that this is a long-term thing as well I mean I, I sort of I mean I get it for some people just being taken out of life and just put somewhere else can be very very helpful it I get for people I get that I don't really have a problem with that I think the issue I have is when people just tank that as the only way of doing things because they've got expensive beds to fill and that's the truth yeah. it's not because it's a business. It's a, it's a business, yeah. um, and, and and that's frankly it. And you know, you can either can we, can we go uh, back in time a little bit because uh, you got me caught up in really interesting things. My I've got tens of doing that. Um, <laughs> I've got lots of soapboxes. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I'm really, I'd love to come and try your VR. To be honest, I mean, I think because I was involved in VR with people with learning disabilities over twenty years ago, and I heard the VR. 
It was, well, the idea was that we had all these files, written files on patients, but they couldn't read or write. So what was, so we create worlds that were meaningful for them within a virtual reality context. And then wow. they were able to lead their care through it. And that was the idea, it was empowering people. And, and I think this stuff is really exciting. And I think particularly now, this late 18 months, I've been saying to people, what we're going to see is developments and treatments that would have normally taken 10 years. And this, I think, is one of them. Very exciting. So I'd love to come and try it out and see what it's like yeah, and maybe demonstrate it to people because they, I think it's brilliant stuff. I, I really do, leading edge. But let's go back in time a little bit. Um, so you're this, I, I suppose, working class kid um, who has a good enough upbringing and... Um, you have this sense of craving of things not being good enough, although it is in objective senses. And you, you then go and try and fill that sense of emptiness or craving or however people want to describe it. Um, what's the next step in that journey, apart from telling your, your friend's mum she's her portions are too small? Um, what does it lead to for you? <sighs> So where does it go? The reason I'm asking you is because I, I, there's a thing I think is very important um, in terms of myth busting and in terms of encouraging people to ask for help is to hear these stories, not as a way of celebrating crappy things that have happened, but just say, well, look, it can change. And I think people caught up in their using often get very, very hopeless about the idea of change. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me... I couldn't do it for anyone else. You know, I had to do it for myself. Sure. Um, and I had to be willing. I had, had to, you don't have to be shouting for rooftops, but you have to be willing. Um, and for me, it started, I was a Metropolitan Police Officer. Okay. Um, the first time I took cocaine was when I passed my medical to get into the police. Of course you did. <laughs> As a celebratory thing. Um, so, I mean, I, it's just, uh, you look back we are out of the possibility of you being prosecutor or anything like that, aren't we? You know? <laughs> You're kind of head full of law, you know, a body full of drugs, you know. But I mean, nobody's there isn't somebody in the Mets going to be listening in and going, right, we're going to nab him for this now. Well, it, it, the great thing about it is you learn the law. There's no, it's not illegal to do drugs. It's illegal to possess them. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I didn't touch them. They just somehow ended up my nose. <laughs> no idea how. So, um, so, <laughs> so the the you know one thing I didn't know is that I had undiagnosed ADHD. Yeah. Right. And and I always kind of thought, is it because you know, I'm, I'm just not interested or I, I, I didn't know. I, I never thought too much about it, but I knew that I put it down to no one had shown me how to study. Yeah. Because I hadn't studied since I was at school and I was terrible at that because I didn't know how to study. Yeah. Um, do I just look through a book and read it and hope to remember it? I don't know. So so I just kind of thought it was down to that. But um, it, I wasn't retaining this information and every week, if you don't get 80 back then they don't do it like this now but you're you're there for 18 weeks you live there at the royal pill center in hendon yeah and um you you've got to pass 80 percent each week or you're out and back then I, I was really struggling i was staying up till three in the morning because it just wasn't going in and falling asleep and then falling asleep in class the next day yeah. and it just wasn't going anyway so i decided to try cocaine again for the second time I was getting 96%. Which is a, oddly enough, it's a classic ADHD response because the treatment for ADHD is a stimulant. Uh, stimulant. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I was flying. It, it was like, it was like I, I was blessed with a superpower. Everything it was going in. I was alert. I was focused. It did for me, once again, what I couldn't do for myself. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and, and then my addiction wasn't normal to, to perhaps many others. It wasn't that yeah. progressive partying environment, you know, and then that progresses and progresses and progresses. Mine was very much isolated yeah. um, from the beginning. And um, let me tell you, being on cocaine with paranoia in police uniform with other police officers, 
is not a healthy mix, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, you know, I want to give you a hug, Nick. I mean, it's just horrific. It's just, I can't imagine how horrible that is. Oh, it, it, you know, you walk past the mirror, you shit yourself. You know? yeah, quite, <laughs> You're a resting coke demon. <laughs> I swear, there's a great conflict of interest going on here. <laughs> And um, I think, you know, back then I was 19 years old. I was on 26,000 pounds a year. It was good money, yeah. you know, back then. And, um, and you know, there was no problems. Was, was that no 1964 problem. or something? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thanks. I mean, I was paying you the compliments, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's no honour here, mate. There's no honour, no friendship. I thought if I get in early with the compliments, I'll get yeah, in. No, I'll yeah. smack you down. That's my assumption there. <laughs> So um, I taught you something about life, mate. It's hard, <laughs> all right. So um so yeah, so I um where was I with that? This is my ADHD again now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so 19, 28 grand a year. 26 grand a, a, a year, and and there was no problem. It was great, everything was fine. You know, there's no with addiction, there's no problem if there's no consequences. Yeah. It's doing for you what you can't do for yourself. So why would you stop it? And you said your your using was very different because of, I guess, because of what you were doing. You weren't going to go out partying. I mean, listen, what I did go out partying from time to time, but the, I'd say eighty percent of of my my using was isolating um, and and you know using it effectively as medic- medicinally. You know, I, I mean, I'm. I mean, I don't know what the figures are, but again, it's a very familiar story to me that the using was antisocial almost from day one. It was not sociable at all. And it's a very familiar story when I talk to people about it and they go, well, you know, I mean, I, quite a lot of people do say I had lots of fun and parties and then changed. But then also quite a lot of people said, well, no, it was never that much fun. I was, it was a transaction it wasn't about socialising. It was about doing something for me. It's a very familiar refrain to it, that that side of things. Yeah. Well, and just out of interest, because, I, I mean, I one of my experiences clinically, I don't know if this is yours as well, is that undiagnosed ADHD is a classic uh, in addiction circles. That, uh, you know, it's yeah. those people that wash through the system again and again and again for years and years and years, and actually they have ADHD and they've just been misdiagnosed. You know, funny enough, I only found out um, that I had ADHD on the back of suffering with postnatal depression from my first boy. Ah. Uh, I wow. didn't know about postnatal depression. I actually was ashamed to tell my wife because I thought how humiliating. And men don't talk about this. I know. It's, it's really common for guys. Men it's really common. Guys don't talk about it. Bri- yeah. Nick, brilliant. Good for you for bringing this up. Thank you. And... And I really struggled for the first six months of my yeah. son, my, my yeah. son, you know, I couldn't, it, anything that I could do as little to do with him. Yeah. Stay at work longer, you know, anything, the weekends I dreaded because there was all these things that I had to do for the newborn, but for the baby to sterilize and the, t- you know, let try and let my wife have a bit of a lay in. And anyway, and I didn't want to tell my wife because she, she was struggling a bit as well. And I thought, how patronising is that? I, I'm not. I didn't even give birth to, to to him. You know, I can't have postnatal depression. That's fascinating stuff. I mean, thank you, Nick. I mean, it's really, really important to hear because um, that thing of depression is what it does is it isolates us and makes us feel alone. Um, and it's the last thing you want to be feeling when you've got a new baby yeah. is that you're on your own because I mean it's tough enough actually for guys because there isn't as much support for guys who become dads and um it's sort of there isn't the, the structures the baby the family and toddler groups are not family toddler groups they're mm-hmm. women and toddler groups they're not absolutely you haven't got that support and and you know for, for me it was you know i'm regimented routine for me i i, sure. I thrive on routine um and the weekend really throws me off actually to the point that I can't even go to the toilet in the morning you know it's it's a regimented routine and i think by having the baby it just threw everything yeah. you forget routine with children yeah 
Yeah, the only team he knows are going to be up. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, I mean, I, I, it's a nightmare to think we've got autism. I shouldn't laugh about it, but neurodiverse people and babies. I mean, it's just like, oh, oh, oh. oh, oh bad. this is oh, bad. Really bad news. But like, so you were saying that's when your ADHD got so, glad. So I, I'm fortunate enough. I've got many <clears throat> friends in in all different positions within this sector, mental health and addictions. And I picked up the phone to a good friend of mine, he's a consultant psychiatrist, and and I got honest with him. And I said, he, he said, it's really funny that you're using the word chores. Why are you using that? Anyway, he kind of started digging a bit deeper and he said, I'd like to do an ADHD assessment on you. Yeah, great, brilliant. And I said, right, okay. Well, I said, how long does that take? He said, four hours. I said, are you joking? I've got, I've got four hours are long, and then when you have to get a new and your parents. For, for four hours. <laughs> We'll do it in 20 cities. <laughs> um, so, so um, yes, he wanted me to sit down and do this kind of test for like four hours. And, and um, it, it turned out that I got ADHD and I tried every, I tried, yeah, dexamphetamine, which is one of the strongest ones. I tried so many of them. And to be honest with you, my level of stimulants, my tolerance of stimulants is so high. Yeah, because you're self-medicated around it. Yeah. Spiral. That when I took the even the dexamphetamine, I hit a come down straight away. Right. And I actually felt worse. I could concentrate less. It was actually, it wasn't working for me. And um, I said to, to the psychiatrist, my friend, I said, I want to take more. So I'm stopping this. Yeah. Um, you know, so I gave it a go for like a, a few a week and 10 days and so my, my head's saying to me, I'm looking at the clock from when my next dose is and yeah. I want to take more. Yeah. Um, and, and I had to get honest there and, 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 and stop. Okay. That. It's interesting. I mean, there's a, there is a, um, um, again, uh, in terms of myth busting and stuff like that, and thank you for your honesty. Um, because the treatment for ADHD is a stimulant, so most people don't get this. It's, it's amphetamine, essentially. Yeah. And not all of the treatments are. There are some which are, non-amphetamine, but the ones that work successfully are. Um, modern versions of these treatments, they don't have the same wave uh, when they enter your system, so that they don't create a high in the craving. Earlier forms, um, Adderall, I think, was one of the earlier ones, did, um, and, and actually addict parents used to get their kids diagnosed so they could have a free supply of amphetamine. Um, that's in the early days, but there's still a big taboo, I think, in the recovery world about the use of medication around ADHD, which I think is sad um, because I've seen it transform people's lives, actually, for those people that haven't burnt out their sort of synapses. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, it's the fact is that they, okay, it's an abstinence-based fellowship in, in, in if you're going down a 12-step fellowship. Yeah. But um, I like I keep saying, one size doesn't fit all. And, exactly. you know, it's 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 um, that was a good part of, I suppose you asked me right at the beginning, what was the, the reasons was the intro? And I mentioned low self-esteem and insecurity. A big part is definitely going to be this un undiagnosed ADHD. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. Well, because you chose a simulator, which is a classic ADHD classic. thing. Classic. Every, you know, I mean, it's one of the first things is somebody comes to me and says they're obsessively using cocaine or or something like that. And it's like, OK, we're going to do an ADHD test first to see whether that's what you're doing, caffeine obsessions and stuff like that. Um, um, so but it's, I mean, you're you're busting a lot of myths and a lot of breaking a lot of taboos, which I love. So good for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's great to hear. Um, and and I, I love the sort of sound of the sort of breaking new ground in treatment. I, I'm sort of totally with you. And also understanding the role of fellowship, because um, I think it's unfortunate, I think, that um, we saw this in the US, beginning to see it more and more in the UK, that as um, uh, funds got narrower in the US for treatment, um, they started bringing in fellowship and, and people without qualifications and uh, sort of coaches and stuff like this and, um, and, uh, and, and have hijacked what is essentially a model that's based upon um, people figuring stuff out together. 
as opposed to being told how to do it? My, my theory on recovery yeah. is um, quite similar to a site, as, as an experiment that was done called Rat Park. You may, you may have... Yeah, no, I yeah, know. Rat Park is... It's the one that, what's his name? Harry goes on about all and, the time, and, and obsessively. And for what, for, for, you know, the long and the short of it is, he touched on something, which is, there's an element there which has a lot of truth to it. And, and, and for me, for anyone that doesn't know about that part, just to very quickly say, there was, they put a rat in a cage, and in this cage, they put two bottles of water, one that was infused with cocaine and one that wasn't. And the rat tried both waters, um, but uh, but kept going back to the one that was infused with cocaine. So then what they decided to do was put a rat park with wheels and tubes and loads of his friends and family yeah. in a cage. And they put the two bottles of water in and every rat went to both waters, but every rat only returned back to the normal water without the cocaine. And it's about it goes on to. So that's kind of where my thought process goes. And then it goes on to about recovery the fellowship is it about doing the 12 steps not necessarily because there's many people that haven't done the 12 steps mm. that well. but i do think it's about connection yes without a doubt connection yeah and i think um for people that don't have friends and family i think the fellowship is 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 vital because you're building this a whole support network and these new family and new friends that you're bringing into your life um, that will support you and they will keep an eye on you and it will you, you can go and do fun things which drugs and alcohol are not part of yeah um, and I, I think it's also finding people that have similar experiences um, is a is a fundamental human need to not feel alone and on your own yeah. it's a we're social animals um, but our lives have become so complex that we do need to be thoughtful about how we get that experience and I, I, one of the things I like about some of the early literature for 12 step is uh, there's a there's a saying we are we are not people who would normally mix um, and there's something about and the evidence is with this now that having a heterogeneous social group that is supportive of you is much healthier for you than having a homogenous group and if you look at using as a social activity, people tend to flock towards those people that use like them. The group becomes homogenous and shuffling, mm. and in effect, does the same thing as lose social ability, um, because you narrow your range of social experiences to the point where basically everybody's exactly the same, and you're only talking about exactly the same things, and become boring and repetitive. Whereas when you go to these fellowship groups, there's a whole range of people with a whole range of experiences, which are they have a commonality in terms of a lot of people have had quite disastrous experiences of using, but they then have a lot heterogeneous experience of life. And, and that's why I think it's really important we have these conversations, because I think the risk of the Russell Brands of the world is that they define too narrowly, and I think you began to speak to that, what the experience of A, the addict using is, and B, the addict in recovery is. And when you narrow the definition, you're losing the therapeutic value. And so, you know, every, the, the different answer for everything. My granddad always had said that alcohol was the answer, alcohol was the answer yeah. to everything. Yeah. He, he never drank, but was a terrible quiz player. <laughs> That's one of your terrible dad jokes, <laughs> which you threatened me with. I pre-warned you. <laughs> I don't know if it's you, is I pre-warned you. <laughs> right. I was wondering when they were coming. You've <laughs> waited till so late, I'd forgotten about them, and then you get me and you sabotage me in that way. Do you, well, you know, I, I change conversations so frequently. When I talk to my friends... Yeah, but you've got ADHD, you're allowed. I, I know. Like, and, and, I, the fact that you can construct sentences given how bad your ADHD is, <laughs> and, I'm bloody the, impressed. The thing is, I generally change them to work towards a bad joke, right? And so now I actually recently got... Diagnosed. Is that a definition of your life? This is pretty much <laughs> well off. And um, so I got recently diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And oh my telling, God, that's painful. Literally. So, uh, so I was telling my wife's best friend who knows me very well, and I said, so I recently got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. She's like, 
yeah, okay, come on, where are you? That's right. And I'm thinking, no, 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 seriously. Seriously. Come on. Seriously. I've more. got a brain tumor. I'm dying in one week. No, seriously, honestly. So, so, you that story of the boy who cried wolf? Yes, exactly that. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about that. I hope it's not too severe, mate. I mean, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's good days and bad days, but it's, uh, yeah, it's... Unfortunately, uh, it's trying to get down, to get, get back to the specialist to get on the right medication. And then the medication you want to give you is like a cancer drug. So then you're kind of weighing up, you know. But as, as long as I'm one of those people that wait to the very last minute. Still, um, Outside of the show, I'll introduce you to a, a good uh, colleague and friend of mine. He's a physio, does pain management. He's brilliant. That'd be great. So, and it's really doing a lot of really good stuff with you that doesn't involve medication and stuff and i'll just email and introduce you to introduction to you both um, thank really you guy. Uh, i've worked with him a lot and um, um for the for the obvious reason you know what i mean um so but how did you i'm going to jump a bit like you now i i tend to think of adhd as a problem <laughs> that Lily had. that's how people with adhd are it's great it's I, just, swear, I love I that give, way of being i give people adhd by talking yeah, yeah yeah it's fantastic it's really interesting way of living <laughs> um so how did you go from using to recovery okay you discovered that these things weren't working i guess you found fellowship first well, well, you yeah, there, was a big, there was a big gap in between that now, you know, right. the, the, the police was the kind of start of my addiction. The, the end of it was I was drug running for Albanian Mafia in Berlin and then ended up homeless in the doorway of Gucci. Yeah. In the um, and, you know, but I come from a great family. <laughs> I, think I was always telling them. They must have been like, what the f- Do you know, yeah. I, will, I, will never, I will never forget this day, you know, it was... <clears throat> I was, I'd been telling my family how well I was doing because I wanted them to be proud of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact yeah. is, I was in a lot of trouble. And um, I remember I was homeless for several, a couple of weeks, a few weeks. And in the doorway of Gucci, don't you know, darling? Um, tramp with an ego, hey? And uh, I remember I, I called up my mum and I said, um, I've got a huge drug problem. Hmm. I'm in a lot of trouble with Albanian Mafia. And I'm homeless. I didn't mess around. There was no niceties. It was literally to the point. Don't, don't oh, thanks, it. son. Thanks yeah. for being open with me. You didn't even ask how I am. Um, so, um, so it was straight to the point. I remember she was incredible. And she said, go to a hotel and get them to call me when you're there. So I went to the Hotel Adlon, which is where Michael Jackson hanged his child over the balcony. And... Um, so I went there and explained the situation. My, they phoned my mum. She paid over the phone with a credit card. I had the longest shower of my life. And the next day I was, uh, I was flown back, back to the UK. And I think I was in rehab kind of four or five days after that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but that's not where I got clean. I relapsed for a year after rehab. And I... That's a fairly standard story. Yeah, which is what I want to stop, right? And yeah, quite unfortunately, exactly. unfortunately for me, I was one of the ones that, yeah, all of this stuff, people saying a relapse can be the best thing. Do you know what? Don't, why, why encourage it? No. <laughs> why encourage it? You know, because some people don't come I work back. a lot with young people, Nick, who come into recovery, and there's no way I'm saying to them, go out no. and have relapses. Absolutely. And no. some people don't make it back from a relapse. No. You know? and, yeah. and, there's um, no need. There's no need. No. Yeah. And I remember I was working, I was just doing some odd jobs and my brother had a security company. I was working for him uh, on the door of a, a club called XXL in Southwark Street, yeah. which um, I thought, great, you know, meet some birds and this, that and the other. I was single and my brother missed a vital bit of information um, that it was a gay fetish club. So, I can see you fitting in nicely there. Actually. Very lonely. I did develop a bit of a fan club. Did you take your life. uniform? At the you? time, I was much more trim and I did look good. So did you wear the Met uniform? Because you'd have no, gone not, no, I did wear a, a bulletproof vest. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I developed it. And um, I remember I was taking a big, you, you might know in the gay scene, it's very big GBH, GBL. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. You know, very common drugs. And one of the things with that is fitting or seizures yeah. um, and very common. And when this is, I remember just January, December 31st, 2008, 11.57 PM. I remember 
I someone was fitting and I called them an ambulance. And whilst I'm waiting for the ambulance, I've taken their wallet. And um, in there, they had cocaine, they had money. And, yeah. and, and um, I remember going to the toilet and looking at myself and I thought, what have you become? Oh, yeah, absolutely. One of those moments. Poor guy who's having a bad yeah, exactly. And I'm robbing him. Yeah. What, what, this is not how, you know, this is. Yeah, not how. yeah. Um, and I remember it was it was New Year's Day because that's my recovery day, 010109. Yeah. And um, and I said, you know, I threw myself in in back into the fellowship and yeah. and, um, and saw this through and, and we're 12 years over 12 well years. Good for you. That's a lovely story. I mean, I think that is, you know, that's genuinely how it happens. It is um sort of um um sort of big movie Hollywood drama. It's Oh God, I'm just, I'm really looking at myself properly for the first time. I don't like what I see. I just, yeah, I, thieving is, is ironically not not something that I was, I, I did, I, I can't recall many instances that I did throughout my addiction. I, I don't know why, I, I just, it was something that I, I didn't, I didn't really like or value in any way. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and I, I, I don't recall really doing it. I, I, I know I did it on a couple of occasions for a small thing, but, but that for me, that 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 was it. That was it. Um, yeah, I mean it's a, it's a real low point, isn't it? But, and um, lucky for you as well, in, in a sense, and also lucky for the people that you subsequently started to help. Mm. Um, so you go from that. You start your recovery journey properly, which is taking responsibility for yourself and going, I don't like this, I'm going to change it. Um, rather than blaming, you go, it's me. I have to do something about me, right? All of that stuff. Um, you take responsibility. And then you move into treatment. Yeah, and so that, that's, that's quite ironic because when, when I needed rehab, we didn't know where to go. Yeah. The only rehab we heard of was the Priory. And unless you got 25 grand, you're not going in there. Yeah. And... Um, and I remember in recovery, I, I came You don't mind me saying this, if you do have 25 grand, I wouldn't bother. I 100% agree with you. You know, I wouldn't bother spending on that. You don't need to spend that sort of money anyway. But um, Well, you know, you can go to nice places and nice rehabs and get far better than that. I agree. So um, the, what was it going with? So I, when I kind of first year in recovery, I was kind of finding my feet and thinking yeah. what I was doing. I remember I didn't know where to go and I thought, I wonder how many other people um, are in that position that can't yeah. afford those sort of places. And it was only because it was a friend of my family's that, that knew a rehab, which was in Bognor Regis. Yeah. Um, and um, so that was, a, that was very affordable. And, and that's where my family put me anyway. So I decided to start phoning around rehabs and finding out what they do and how much yeah. they charge and who they treat and what, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then those questions got better as I learned more and, you know, and looking at other services. So what if you can't go into rehab because you've got children dependent on you? What, what other options are there? So I started to build up this information and then um, people just started phoning me. Um, yeah. and the phone rang and it was, and anyway, it's now one of the largest addiction advisory services in the country. And right. we've got a team of people that answer the phones. And, and then, so Basically, we we hear because we're the front line, we know what people want or what their needs are, and yeah. we also learn a feedback because we follow up with people for once they've left. What didn't you like about the rehab? What would you yeah. change? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. basically consolidated this all this information and made our rehab. Great. Um, and and we we literally it, it's it's based on what people want not what we think is best. Um, and and so, then you moved on to setting up your own building based. Yeah, so... Got I'm the, sorry I'm moving us on because we are running out of time. I told you go in no time at all. But I so, want to make sure people know about your services. So Yeah, so we've, we set up the residential rehab in Norfolk, which is Verve Health. And, yeah. um, and um, oh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just amazing just watching, watching these, these people coming broken and just coming out just... It's just it's brilliant. That's what it's about. I just saw your face there, Shesha. I think everybody else did. And that 
that tells us everything we need to know, Nick. Really, seriously. Um, you, you lit up talking about helping people. You're amazing. Um, You're amazing. There's just one guy, really quickly. Go on. From Hong Kong, right? Came over from Hong Kong. He's English. Um, yeah. He was in a wheelchair, right? Not because of any physical, physical damage, <clears throat> because he didn't use his legs and he couldn't walk. He couldn't, couldn't walk. He, he could get up and he's on crutches. The guy was playing football last week. And, you Correct. Know, like the right. You know, and it's just... That's it. It's That's just, it. Honestly. Brilliant. Brilliant. Where can people find out more about the services that you provide? What are your websites? So because there's a variety of services, probably best following me on Instagram, which is at Dad in Recovery. Um, and right. It's got Great. pretty much all the services on there. We'll put a link out there so that people can... King. Nick, it's been a genuine pleasure to have a chat with you. I have loved this. Yeah, have it's loved been this. really good fun. Oprah, Oprah called me. She wanted to book me for nine o'clock tonight. Yeah, I, I well, I'm glad I got in there first. I think I made the right choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's rubbish. She's rubbish. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's all CGI, mate. There's yeah. no real, I'm telling you, when you meet her in real life, she's an Irish leprechaun. <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah. Everything else is CGI, I'm yeah. telling you. Um, yeah, big budget productions, that's what it is, you know. All of this is CGI. <laughs> All of this is really cool. Like, uh, okay, uh, if only. It's been a real pleasure. It genuinely has. I mean, I sort of found, feel like I've got to know you, actually. Likewise, so, thank you. Um, and you're a nice bloke, and um, so good for you. Um, but we've got to finish there, folks. You stay there, Nick. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. We do have to finish there. That was... Um, uh, sort of it surprised me actually uh, sort of how much I enjoyed it so um, really good to have you all with us um, um, you've got the links for Nick's check him out good guy uh, I'll see you all next week I think we've got somebody on next week I have no idea who it is but I'm sure we'll have a good laugh um, and um, good night for now see you all soon I hope bye bye <laughs>